this is the second welcome to the second Think Global webinar of the spring um, semester. So first, let me introduce myself. So my name's Liz Turner. I'm an Associate Professor of Biostatistics and Global Health here at um, Duke University. So um, joint between the Biostatistics Department and the Global Health Institute. I'm also the director of the DGHI Research Design and Analysis Corps. So we're a 10 member team. We're integrated really into the fabric of DGHI. We work alongside its researchers, its students to really try to advance health equity. So the members of our group, the Research Design and Analysis Corps were biostatisticians, epidemiologists, health economists, data scientists, data architects. So we work with both quantitative and qualitative research um, data primarily with quantitative data. So basically, I like the members of our team, we live, breathe and eat data. And so as such, it's really my pleasure to be able to moderate today's seminar. So what is this? This is artificial intelligence, data science and global health, AI data science and global health. So really this is, we're gonna cover emerging approaches for analyzing complex data sets, how this has enormous potential for global health. In this panel, we have researchers who are working really at the leading edge of artificial intelligence, geographic information systems, data analysis. And we'll explore how data can be harnessed to improve disease surveillance, diagnosis, allocation of health resources and a range of other topics. Now, this is important and well-timed that Duke, with a kind of bigger Duke, has a very kind of directed approach to try to really kind of build expertise in data science, um, AI, other kind of um, data topics in this realm. So we're interested to at DGHI as to how we can fit within this, these goals. And very importantly, our um, Associate Director of Research, Wendy O'Meara, really wants to bring DGHI um, to bring to bear these methods within our work at DGHI. So um, a few housekeeping things, please put your questions into the Zoom Q&A rather than the chat down box and we'll be monitoring this along the way and we'll try our best to cover as many questions as we can. So without further ado, we have three fantastic panelists. Um, I'll introduce them in turn and um, before we move over to some questions. So um, Professor Andy Tatum, also from England, as am I, um, is Professor of Spatial Demography and Epidemiology at the University of Southampton and the Director of WorldPop and at um, Flowminder. So his research has really led to pioneering approaches to the use and integration of satellite, survey, cell phone, and census data to map um, the distrib distributions of vulnerable populations in terms of disease, disaster, and development applications. Let's move over now to um, Dr. Joao Visochi. Um, so Joao is an assistant professor of surgery and global health at Duke. His research interests include applying data science and technology to really innovate um, ways that can be innovating ways to address um, access to care and health system gaps in global health and remote areas. So his work um, also includes the use of geospatial analyses, geostatistics, and um, touches on latent variable modeling, psychometrics, and um, machine learning. Welcome, Joao. Welcome, Andy. Now to um, our third panelist, Eric Labour. So Eric recently joined Duke as a professor of statistical science and biostatistics and bioinformatics. And we're fortunate that he's now getting involved with our work um, at, in the Global Health Institute. So his research focuses on data-driven decision-making with applications in precision health, public health, defense, and retail planning. Um, he works in data-driven decision-making, and we're gonna be talking about that more along the way. Um, so without further ado, what we'll do is go through with um, a key question for each of our panelists before we turn over and have um, more opportunity for questions from all of you. So let's start with um, Andy. So Andy, you started World Pop really with the goal of using geospatial data sets to improve healthcare and low resource settings. We'd love to hear a little bit about um, how you do this work, how are these kinds of data kind of helping countries make better decisions about allocating resources? Please, um, we'd love to hear about that. Sure. Thanks, Liz. And yeah, thanks for inviting me. Um, yeah, I guess we started World Pop to try and address problems around particularly population data, the very basics of uh, where people are and how many there are in a place and who those people are. Um, in higher income countries like in the US and UK, we often take for granted that uh, we know how many people there are in a small area. Um, for a certain year, 
um, and we have censuses that are regularly done and rigorously done, and we have um, administrative data sources that can keep those numbers up to date. Uh, and some countries, like in Scandinavia and the Netherlands, have completely got rid of censuses because their administrative records are so good. Um, but if we look in countries in, in sub-Saharan Africa, for instance, um, there are situations there where there hasn't been a census for 20 or 30 years um, and there are decisions being made about allocation of uh, vaccinations, uh, allocation of resources, uh, a range of very important decisions based on very uncertain data. Um, but what we do have uh, are geospatial data sets that are coming from satellite mapping of individual buildings. They're coming from surveys that are geolocated um, uh, other geospatial data sets that indicate things related to, to how populations distribute themselves on the landscape. So in WorldPOP, um, we're a group of about 25 researchers at the University of Southampton. Uh, we are developing methods um, for integrating these geospatial data sets with traditional data sets coming from surveys and census to try and complement those to get more detailed uh, population data uh, and more up-to-date population data. And um, nowadays working uh, pretty regularly with national statistics offices across multiple countries to, to support them in producing those data and, and using them for things like vaccination campaigns, for things like planning strategies against uh, COVID. Um, so that's, uh, that's where we are, we are at the moment. Super, thank you so much, Andy. Um, and I'm sure people will be coming back with questions um, related to this. So now let's move to Joao. Um, Joao, you've been um, using some very large national data sets to inform better decisions about allocation of healthcare resources. Could you give us some examples of your work, please? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Liz. Uh, and it's great to be able to speak after Andy because he explained half of what I'm trying to do currently with the work from World Pop, which is very exciting. So what, what, I've, been try what I've been doing uh, in a lot of our global health work as part of the Gemini, which is uh, the Global uh, uh, Emergency Medicine Innovation Implementation Lab that I co-lead here at Duke, but also as part of the Research Design and Analysis Core, is to uh, leverage secondary data, specifically health system secondary data, uh, in a way to understand issues about access to care, distribution of care, or care delivery. So similar to what Andy said a little bit uh, earlier on, uh, identifying where people live is uh, the first step. And the second step is identifying how can we optimize resource allocation based on where healthcare facilities are and the dynamics of the health systems. And we're very fortunate to be able to work from, with uh, data from Brazil, where I'm originally from, because Brazil has a very large national health system that is mostly public. It's about 70% of the population that's attended mostly uh, only for, by the public health system. And they collect data on every kind of hospitalization or every kind of health system interaction that gives us a nationally distributed source of data to understand where diseases are happening, diseases trends over time, diseases trends within the geographical space, but also where diseases are being taken care of in relationship to where people are located. And we've been able to show, for instance, that places where we had a surge of COVID deaths or COVID related outcomes were also places where you had way less access to care or worse, hard uh, difficulty access to care due to traveling uh, distances or just not ad adequate roadway infrastructure. That's an example when you can talk more about other things. Thank you very much, Joao. I know we'll be coming back to some of those topics. So now let's move to um, Eric. So Eric, your work focuses on um, data-driven decision-making. We would really like to hear about kind of the scope of those decisions, really kind of as it relates to healthcare, health equity, et cetera. Are we talking about kind of real-time decisions, decisions in kind of not in real time. Could you speak somewhat to what you mean about data-driven decision-making, please? Sure, yeah, and, and thanks uh, for inviting me and thanks everybody for coming. Um, so I'm, I'm interested in, in decisions across a very wide range in, in healthcare. So I think the, the obvious example is like what treatment we should give somebody, you know, based on what they present with in order to maximize efficacy. But quickly, uh, even in that simple case, you know, thinking about well, what is what do we mean 
in terms of efficacy and how do we balance you know, one measure of efficacy with another or with side effects or cost or preference. And so there's, the, there's this whole area of trying to do um, utility maximization for patients in terms of treatment recommendations. But then there's also the study of, you know, how are decisions being made currently? Can we study, uh, you know, treatment decisions that are being made by clinicians and understand is there variance across clinicians? Is that variance being driven by factors we aren't measuring? Are some people making better decisions than others? Are others, um, you know, are people adopting to new trends, you know, quicker? Uh, I think there's also things about, you know, how do we make decisions to generate information? So uh, if we want to improve our decision support systems, uh, what's the best sort of way to allocate treatments? Uh, and how do we do that in a way that is safe? Uh, I think there, there's uh, also this idea of like, how do we make or help people make better decisions? So one of the big things I, I focus on uh, is human in the loop decisions. So uh, on the one hand, there's a sort of science fiction vision of uh, artificial intelligence driven decision making for health where health is completely automated. Uh, but the reality is for a lot of these, you know, serious uh, illnesses or serious decisions, what we want to do, the decisions can be made by a person and it should be made by a person, but how do we help that person synthesize very complex data from multiple sources to help them make the best possible decisions so they can integrate their own expertise with what exists in, in data sources. Um, and then in terms of, you know, at what Temporal resolution. I mean, on the one hand, we have things like M Health, where we're pushing out recommendations to people in real time, and that's an example where the AI may actually be making decisions. But those might be things like you should, uh, you know, go take a walk today. The weather is nice to increase your step count, or uh, you know, trying to help you plan your evening if if maybe you're somebody who is uh, struggling with addiction, uh, and they want to make sure that you plan your leisure time to to be sure that you're safe. Uh, and so there's a very wide range, you know something like that, where you might have many little nudges that are going out to somebody or something much more serious about whether we should, uh, you know, undergo surgery or recommend surgery or not. And so I think uh, my research kind of cover, tries to cover a, a lot of these types of decisions uh, and, you know, try, tries to uh, generate information that's useful to decision makers, uh, but doesn't replace their expertise, I think. Um, yeah, maybe I'll Thank stop you. there. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Eric. So this actually is a great segue into uh, maybe um, some perspectives we'd like to hear from all of you. And but Eric, you may wish to add something at this stage. So let's just um, come straight back to you. So in our um, topic today, you know, we're talking about AI, so artificial intelligence, data science, and global health. Um, now you've sort of touched on this, Eric. Um, Artificial intelligence, so AI, it means a lot of things to a lot of different people. Um, for example, like you did uh, allude to this kind of like an image of kind of a robot, a machine, and, and potentially even taking over from a human is often kind of what we think about. But you've also kind of brought us along a spectrum really of what AI may mean. So can you just share a little bit more about how you may even just describe AI and how it can be used in, and what it means to global health? What, how would you describe AI to somebody who doesn't really know what AI is and maybe thinks of it as robots taking over from humans? Is there anything else you'd like to add? And then we'll uh, move over to, to, to Andy and to Joao. Sure, yeah, I, I, I mean, I define artificial intelligence as just using data, uh, well, in artificial intelligence in healthcare, I should say. It's just using data to make better, uh, to make healthcare better. And so that's a huge spectrum. I mean, there, there's data, that can be used for all sorts of things, you know, ranging from looking at billing records or insurance uh, information to identify maybe rare interactions or to run clinical trials to uh, you know, generate new clinical knowledge, uh, and, or it could be you know robot-assisted you know surgery if you're somebody who does uh, robotics and AI or reinforcement learning, uh, and so it's a very broad umbrella. Uh, and so I think sometimes it's not quite so glamorous. It's just something as simple as uh, trying to, to use data to get the most information out of a clinical trial while protecting patients, right? So uh, it, it's not always uh, so fantastical maybe. Although I will say the, the sort of the North Star for some of these projects that I'm involved in or the things that I get excited about, you know, can be ambitious in the sense that maybe if we're talking about preventative medicine, maybe we monitor everything or you, you, know, you opt in, but, but something that, that monitors your diet and your exercise and your medications and your environment and tries to synthesize all that information you know, for you 
to help you make better decisions in, in all sorts of aspects of your life. And, you know, we're getting there technologically. It's just, um, it's just a matter of like synthesizing very complex data. And I think that the other panelists probably think a lot about synthesizing new messy, complicated data into usable information. So that's a big part of it too, I think. Thank you so much, Eric. So yeah, Andy, it would be great to hear your thoughts um, on this terminology, AI, data science. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, there's a lot of buzzwords, I would say. <laughs> um, big data, massive data, is, uh, uh, and I think um, it is powerful if it's directed in the right way. And so um, for us engaging with um, ministries of health and national statistics offices and hearing from them about the challenges they face and then linking that back to what could be done with these, these new forms of data and new techniques. Um, so the, the really exciting part for us is around extracting information from satellite images. So uh, we've had, uh, um, for ages, we've been working with um, census data that gives us information that there are, for instance, 20,000 people in one administrative unit, um, but not really any information to be able to break that down into smaller, uh, smaller estimates. Uh, be able to understand where are their scattered rural dwellings to to reach for, for vaccination activities um, but uh, and then previously we've kind of worked with satellite images and volunteers who've then been able to go and spot uh, and draw a draw a square around every single individual building but if you're thinking about a, a country like democratic republic of congo that's the size of uh, western europe it's just not feasible to do that and keep it up to date uh, but now the capabilities and accuracies of um, artificial intelligence, computer vision type approaches to be able to extract every single building pretty accurately from recent satellite images across an entire country, in fact, an entire continent now, so all of sub-Saharan Africa has been done recently. Um, it's really revolutionized what we can do now in terms of accuracies of being able to identify where people are likely to live. It doesn't necessarily tell us exactly where everybody lives, but we can then start to link it with survey data to estimate numbers of people and direct survey teams to go to areas that have, that have never even appeared on maps. So it's, it's that kind of power that's really exciting for us, I think. Thank you so much, Andy. Joao, what would you say about your feelings? <laughs> yeah, uh, so the, 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 I think Eric and Andy made a great job uh, portraying this concept of artificial intelligence being this way to synthesize data, making data make decisions for us or support decisions for us in a faster way in, in allowing us to even increase our capacity to engage with real world, because world, data is out there all the time. Uh, and the examples of mobile health, like I have this watch that tells me if I need to get up because I've been sitting too long and all that, and how you can uh, harness this power to help us make better living choices or better health choices. But then it goes off on the spectrum that artificial intelligence is now can be understood as part of this data science world and sometimes is used interchangeably, but not necessarily the same way. So if, you, if you're coming from a different perspective from computer science, you also have artificial intelligence as part of your disciplines and not necessarily as a, as a data science discipline. So it's, it's, a, it's a word, it's like, like Andy said, a buzzword that is used in different fields in different ways. And uh, from a data science perspective, I completely agree that it's a way to synthesize data, try to make data help support automatically or some automated way to give us back feedback or give us back information. But I, I also like to stress that artificial intelligence as part of this data science world is within a concept of data science that I remember when I was finishing my PhD and with a background in social science, uh, a lot of people ask me now why I'm doing some kind of work that I do on traumatic brain injury or snake biting venomation or even health if I have a background in mental health. And I remember that at, at that time, we used to call ourselves meddlers or something because we we're terrible at giving names to ourselves, but then data science wasn't really a big thing. And then in the end, it kind of became this umbrella that people that had good computing skills along with good uh, technical skills or understanding of data skills along with content skills are a way to apply this information to 
real practice became this umbrella of data science that then emerged to what we have today. So I always like to stress the fact that artificial intelligence and data science are these components of understanding data. And the data is for me is the center part of all of this because data, if you look at what Eric said, it can come from trials in a very structured way that has multiple assumptions on how the data is developed that somebody analyzing it need to understand to be able to extract more information out of it. Or you're working with satellite image like uh, uh, Andy said, that is not designed to give you some specific information. And then you're trying to find a way to transform that thing, synthesize that huge volume of information into something that's feasible, something that people can understand and use. So the data portion of it is how we synthesize and leverage this. And it, it's just not necessarily quantitative data. So the satellite imagery data, there's qualitative information. We can get text, we can get uh, what people write on the internet uh, and build models to identify personality traits, build models to identify risk behaviors uh, out of this. So it's really getting the data that we develop in a daily basis. And uh, I love the word that Eric used, synthesizing it and putting it into back to giving us better opportunities or better ways to answer our problems. Thank you, Joao. And this is a great segue, actually, to talk a bit more deeply about data. And as you said, Joao, this really underpins all the work that the three of you are talking about. Before I pose this question, I'd just like to say we're monitoring the Q&A. We're actually, we're going to get to the question there from the Q&A, and I'd encourage others of you to um, add any other questions that you have. So we'll very soon get to as many of the questions as we can. So date, I'm hoping now to go to Andy. Um, data. Could you talk a little bit about how much of your work, so perhaps even at Pop Health, help us understand kind of the balance between how much time is spent on collecting data, managing data, processing data versus the, perhaps you could say the more analytic part of the work and then the communication and all the other pieces that go into your work. Could you, perhaps with an example, um, give us a sense of that? Thank you. Yeah, I, I guess, when it was maybe 15 years ago when we started World Pop, um, it was that was that was more the time when I was day to day handling the data. But uh, it was, uh, I guess, it, it took probably 80 or 90 percent of our time to uh, obtain, clean, process, um, manage, <laughs> integrate different data sets, um, and then the the perhaps the, the cool part, the data science that we're, we're all talking about, that's probably only 10% of the time, but it's the exciting part. So I think there's uh, it's something that we, we all need to keep in mind, but I mean, particularly when we're working with data sets that are coming from multiple fields and they've been collected for a completely different reason and we're bringing them together for, for one reason, um, or data sets that are coming from different government ministries or different survey teams and there's a need to check for completeness quality um, so a huge part of our work is is working with these data producers uh, data providers understanding quality and uh, the harmonization to be able to get just get to that stage of integrating them and extracting new insights from them is um, is yeah I guess definitely more than half of our work but probably more so uh, it's it's always something that is uh, it's not surprising to me anymore but it's often surprising to those kind of new to the field in terms of it's not a magic press a button and uh, the, the magic AI and data science will will give you the results there's a lot of pre-processing and work beforehand thank you Andy I think you've just done a wonderful um justification for why I kind of those who fund our research really need to kind of pay attention to this need to process data in a kind of valid, appropriate fashion. So that there's many directions we could go right now. Um, and what I'd like to do is we'll circle back a little bit more explicitly to data, privacy, and other issues and how that may re relate to, say, Andy's work with Flowminder, with cell phone data. Let's just get to this first question in the Q&A, very much related around um, coming back a little bit to this data-driven decision-making. And kind of, and, and, and actually I'll pose the question we were, we were planning on asking a question along these lines around kind of potential for bias in AI and this will, will maybe we can start with Eric and 
Andy and Joao, you may have something to add. So here at the Global Health Institute, we're very much focused on health equity. And there's a lot, we know kind of in our world today, there's a lot of talk about equity, whether it be related to race, gender, and other kind of um, in other domains. So um, we have this question here, kind of what, to what extent does data-driven decision-making um, evaluate how some predictive models may pr produce unintended negative, in this case, public health consequences? So an example being that related to um, race. Eric, would you like to please start um, with the response here? Yeah, I'm looking at these questions and, and no one's pulling any punches. These are like the, the, they're asking all the really hard questions. I mean, so this is a huge problem. Uh, and in terms of building predictive models that are, you know, if you're trying to build something that, that imitates a system that's already biased, then you have a huge problem. But there's also these issues that, that you know, there could be subtle things that are happening that you're replicating or exacerbating. And uh, I don't think there's an easy way to, I mean, this is an active open area of research. It's not my, my, really my area, but um, I just think that this is, this is, uh, a huge part of developing uh, decision support systems and, and digging into what they're doing and, and trying to stress test them and try to evaluate them as best we can because there's just been plenty of examples uh, where we, we fit one of these systems and it uh, either maintains bias or makes bias worse. Uh, and so it's not just how the algorithm is built, but it's also what data we use to train the algorithm and evaluate the algorithm and where it's deployed and who gets access to it. Uh, so uh, I don't really have an answer or a solution, but except to say that this is a, uh, a really important uh, area of research currently. So, Thank you. And g given, you, as you say, Eric, this is such a hot topic and a challenging question, I think this would be a nice one to turn over to our other panelists. So to um, Andy, let's come back to you and move to Joao. Andy, have you had examples of this where you've had concerns even in your own work? Uh, yes, so yes, yeah, certainly biases in data. Um, so some of the collaborations I've actually had with um, Wendy O'Meara, I think, who's on the, on the call previously, is around the use of mobile phone records. Uh, and here we are, we're utilizing um, call detail records, so the anonymized and aggregated data um, from people making use of mobile phones to in, for us to infer population level estimates of movement patterns. Um, but what we always have to keep in mind with these is that these data are, are, are incredibly biased in some cases. Uh, we're working in countries where phone ownership can be biased towards the richest of the populations, the most urban. Um, there can be some people owning multiple phones, some just one phone per household. So we're just tracking the movements of, in some cases, the, the, the richest and the, um, the geographically biased parts of the population. So I think it's always something where, again, in that those early stages of planning these kinds of projects and in the data harmonization part that, and ex exploration part, that first part I mentioned that takes up definitely more than half the time, needs to be very clear digging into the data to, to check its representativeness and ideally in any modeling to actually build in those uncertainties into the modeling so for us when we're now producing population maps and estimates we're doing that with, with bayesian models to produce outputs with full uncertainty around them to, to actually when we're presenting these to policymakers, we're trying not to give them just a single number to say that we we definitely know that there are 100 people in this area we are actually giving them confidence intervals to say okay if you are if you're thinking about vaccinating and you want to make sure all the children under five are vaccinated uh, then you should use the upper level limit of this confidence interval we are we're 95 percent sure that there are uh, there are at most 300 children under five in this area or something like that so it's uh, it's i think it's vitally important to understand these biases and to make sure you're not if you're if you're just taking data and putting it straight into a model and not understanding that data, that's a very dangerous route to go. I think. Thanks so much, Andy. So now I'd like to turn to Joao and perhaps weave in um, a related question that we have in the Q and A and give everybody an opportunity to comment on this. So. And, and Joao, please feel free also to talk more broadly about the question we've been speaking on. So 
there's this question posed in the Q&A. So in extension to this health equity question, how can or can AI be used? I, we, we, we could also pose, how can AI be used to reduce bias and disparity in healthcare delivery? Maybe to Joao and we'll allow um, Eric and Andy to have an opportunity afterwards. Yeah, I think that it's, it's, it's pretty clear now that the models or whatever we can get out of with this AI uh, approaches or other types of approaches that are not AI specific are gonna represent whatever the data source is. And so we need to do a lot better work in getting better data. And this is a panel at the Duke Global Health Institute that talks about equity across the world in terms of healthcare. And when we talk about that, we have, uh, uh, we need to discuss equity in data and data generation and data quality as well. So if most models are developed out of data coming from high income countries or like the United States, then most models are going to reflect this society. So how are they going to, how are these models going to be able to detect the nuances of health systems that have problems of access to care and that a hospital is not within two hours of driving distance from everybody. So I think that uh, the first way to answer this question of how AI can help uh, uh, reduce this, uh, be, be more equitable to healthcare is that we can leverage the power of data that's already existing. So the word that Andy is, ref is ref the work that Andy is doing with I, using uh, demographic data to identify and then satellite imagery to identify where people are in that way, understanding where gaps in care are. I think it's a great way to answer that question as examples of how we can try to reduce this inequity. As a, uh, what we've been doing uh, again related to COVID, but also other kinds of healthcare delivery systems is using uh, the world pop information to identify where people are located and then understanding where, where are people that are actually outside of the boundaries of the health system and how we can create plans to get healthcare to reach this population using the network that's already pre-established. And that's only possible because we have this built infrastructure, but we also have data. So there's, a, there's the, for me, the, one of the approaches to answer this problem of how can we make this model stop reproducing what's out there besides all the modeling that's developed, that it's a field of study that needs to engage computer scientists, statisticians, uh, 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 people from, uh, that study law and the legislation to understand these boundaries as well and how AI reaches the ethical components. But overall, again, it's centered in data. So we need better data, global data development processes, quality checks, ability to uh, develop and also make this data interoperable to the rest of the, uh, the world coming from this, poor, this uh, low resource areas or low income areas that are, are the ones facing these challenges. Thank you, Joao. And I know that you've done work um, in, equity, in, in equities in care for indigenous people um, in Brazil. Is that something you could speak to now, how concretely AI may be able to help reduce um, health inequities? Yeah, so in, in, in that ties back to a, a little bit of what I was saying earlier on. We're, we're, so we're doing this project now that we're during, during COVID, we, we started this project, but ideally uh, we've been doing this project to understand how uh, environmental change, climate change, and uh, environmental consequences of this process of deforestation in, in the Amazon uh, forest and uh, similar locations have been, have been influencing healthcare status of indigenous population. And to be able to do that, we have been working with very intensive, uh, heavy multidimensional data from climate, from the environment, from deforestation, uh, uh, human dynamics and uh, healthcare and uh, system networks as well to be able to come up with solutions to better understand patterns and predict patterns in a way to better distribute resources. We know that, and then what we did is we took that infrastructure of work and then we started applying that to COVID vaccine distribution in a way to better understand how we could optimize distribution to better serve indigenous populations in relation to where COVID was hitting them harder at that time. And so building this kind of systems allows us to optimize how resources are distributed within a network in a way that then resources that are scarce and uh, COVID vaccines are definitely a scarce resource globally right now can then be put to use in places where they can have most uh, impact. So then what we did is we studied 
the distribution of indigenous population across the Amazon region and understanding where they were. And then we also modeled how the disease was going to uh, be, uh, how the disease was going to pro progress within this population. And by looking at this progression, we all could estimate based on uh, population metrics we had from these this indigenous tribes uh, and help develop a plan for uh, vaccine distribution that would try to reduce uh, risk groups and uh, facilitate uh, uh, healthcare issues. So that's one of the examples that we can use it for, but we had good data and that data was coming from years of projects that were well established with these groups and that allowed us to do this as well as work like World Pop that allowed us to have uh, secondary data in a good quality. Thank you, Joao. You've really been speaking, yeah, as, as you just ended on data quality, kind of the role of humans, of partnerships, of collaboration, um, um, et cetera. So what I'd like to do is turn to Eric and then back to Andy, that will remain on this topic of kind of health equity, how AI can be used really to reduce bias. Let's just see what, what how you'd like to touch on that. And let's just bring in this question of what, Eric, we have a question here in the Q&A. What kind of balance is struck in terms of the factors that contribute to the design of models and algorithms, the test uh, data sources versus kind of the interdisciplinary, so maybe more the human um, insight and expertise? And, and just as Eric is uh, about to start his response, I'd like to say we'll soon be moving over more to data privacy issues. And I know Andy will have quite some more to say about that. So I wanted to let you all know about where we'd like to go a little bit with the conversation. So Eric, before we move to, um, um, to Andy. So on the topic of, of um, health disparities, and so so one of the one of the big changes has been just done on scalability, and that how AI and just technology more generally has made some some forms of healthcare uh, much more scalable. So through M Health and Telehealth, being able to um, get uh, say, for example, me mental health is a big one where we can get people support uh, where they might not otherwise be able to get it. So we could have FaceTime cognitive behavioral therapy, for example. There's a lot of online forms now where people can find peer support or they can find online counseling. Uh, we also have you know automated AI-driven support systems for people with, with addiction or for people who have uh, you know need need help, let's say with a, a crisis management plans. Uh, I think another thing is you know, AI has been used to reveal disparities where it was people maybe knew they were there but couldn't quite get that, um, couldn't quite get sort of convincing evidence, right? But then once you start digging into the data and you find there are there are major trends that can't be explained as special cases anymore. And we've seen that in, in health. We've also seen it in places like, you know, the justice system and um, uh, banking and other areas. And so, you know, it can also be used, I think, to it can certainly uh, be used as a tool that, that is biased and, and replicates bias, but also identifies these kinds of things. Um, and then I think we, you know, we're also seeing it to help uh, manage certain kinds of disparities that we know about, like how do you navigate a food desert? So can we provide people with technological tools uh, to, to help them find, say, healthy food uh, where it, it isn't so easy? Um, and, and so there's some applications in that space. Uh, but I also supposed to touch now on, the, on this other thing, which is the the design of models and al models and algorithms. Is that if you're able to at this point, that would be we'd love to hear your insights. So yeah, what's the, the kind of balance is struck in terms of factors that contribute to the design of models and algorithms versus kind of like the test data sources, those versus interdisciplinary expertise and insight. And you have touched on this. Do you have more? I think in in my in my world anyway, and I, I think it's probably different uh, for Joe and, and Andy. But the you know a lot of my work comes from somebody having a question about the state of the world in terms of uh, which isn't say of course that I'm sure the tribes your too, but I mean they'll have some model for for example, uh, you know is this drug effective in the subpopulation or is there some other thing going on and we want to dig into it, and so that so that sort of starts the whole process and then we might look you know, for data that exists that might help us generate some support for the idea, or maybe we run a trial. And uh, in the course of doing that, we now generate new hypotheses that we didn't anticipate originally. And this whole thing kind of feeds on itself. It becomes kind of this flywheel where uh, you, have you have sort of a question and then you have data and then you maybe 
uh, posit some models and then you run a trial to evaluate those models and then you refine them and then there's new hypotheses and so on. Uh, and so uh, that's all sort of interwoven with domain experts who are looking at this data and these models and making sure that they do make sense and uh, that we aren't missing things because the data alone uh, aren't, aren't sufficient. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Eric. And you, you've really started touching on, um, uh, we'll, we'll move to Andy now to see what you'd like to add to this. And perhaps you'd even like to comment on the, the question um, here we have in the Q&A. So how do you gain trust to deploy these models, particularly for more high impact applications? Um, Andy, would you, on these topics? Yeah, I can, I guess the, 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 the trust one is something we deal with every day. And um, I guess we 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 started with well, but with with a more of a academic group and thinking about okay how do we how do we better map populations in in detail and spatial detail and um, we would do those models and then put them out there on the web and that was great but it, it ended up with mainly other academics using our data sets but not really getting to the to the end users and and so yeah this this gaining trust to actually deploying the models. These are, and if you think about people in national statistics offices and ministries of health, they are incredibly busy people and, and just don't have the time to learn about AI and data science. And so there has to be, um, has to be a, a slower and more, it's sometimes it's a more painful engagement, but it's in the end point, it does produce more more actual uptake and use if we are engaging with these end users right from the very start of the project and listening to what the challenges are that they face, um, listening to about the, the politics that come in as well, particularly if we are population numbers are incredibly sensitive and political, they determine electoral boundaries, they determine how much uh, aid and resources different regions of a country get. So um, for us, it, it has to be us taking a step back and letting them lead the way. Um, so we've done projects that have been led by um, the president of Afghanistan. We've had projects that have been just driven by um, Nigeria stats office. Um, and we've been having to then go basically be being drawn uh, along that route, um, uh, making sure that we are not being drawn into the politics that we are continuing to to let the data speak for for itself and uh, and produce outputs that are rigorous so it's 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 very complicated and it takes a lot more time than if we were just sitting on our own in southampton in a room typing away and doing these analyses um but the impact is is well worth it i think the, uh, for our group at least most of the, the people that join are excited because of the way their research can go, go rapidly into actual use in the field. Um, but they do have to accept this comes with a lot of pains along the way, but I think it's worth it. Thank you, Andy. This is um, a great segue, actually. You've been really talking about data as a public good. I was hoping perhaps, please unmute if you'd like to add something to this but we and we may move to let, let's move to Joao and to say a little more so Andy in case there's anything you'd like to add to kind of what are our responsibilities to the communities people who provide the data is there something you'd like to sort of add on this note data is a public good and then let's move to Joao before we start moving into privacy issues um yeah I mean data is a public good is I think it's it's fantastic as long as we are balancing this is privacy data confidentiality and um, and also being yeah very um, open about how it's how it's been produced the limitations um, just putting everything out there so that um, people can understand and use this data in the appropriate way and they understand that the the, the, the confidentiality and the, the, the sensitivity of the data has been protected um, and as long as that's the case, then yeah, then putting these out as a public good, I think that's and that's a large part of the goal of our research group. So I'm very much behind um, producing these and making these openly available. Thank you, Andy. Now to Joao, what thoughts would you share on data as a public good? Data kind of as a living. Yeah, 
and I, and, I, and I think I want to touch base with uh, a little bit of the, the answer uh, b before that. Uh, one of the big pieces about AI is building the models and getting the data into something manageable. But there's a, a large piece of this entire work that is transforming these into meaningful tools or meaningful information. And by and, and the way to transform this into meaningful information is in direct engagement with the, uh, the, the people, people on the ground, right? Providers and whoever is, uh, is gonna be the, the, the target that Andy was referring to. Uh, so I think that there's a strong piece of this whole data science AI that develops innovative ways to look at data that is aligned with the implementation needs that is also understood by implementation science in a way to kind of, how do we build these tools with an implementation perspective and the mindset? And by that, we're gonna be able to really provide tools that mean something uh, and not models that are not answering to a question uh, that is a real need. Uh, and so, and, and then that buys back into this discussion that the data we use to generate these models uh, and how this data is generated, it's actually something that we live in a daily basis. So the data is from the, is, is from the, the participants of the trial with data is from whoever is using that data and leaving that in generating the data by their own uh, behavior and existence. So I think that there's an, there's an important element of thinking projects and how we develop data for projects that the data answers to a question, but the data is an eternal uh, thing that can be used and should be used to leverage other uh, question. So there's a, there's a strong ethical, in my perspective, component to developing data that is more than answering the question for a project, but developing something that could be answering questions for other projects if given the opportunity for researchers or enterprises to explore that information. But then that has, as Andy said, a, a very, very problematic boundary that we're still yet to develop across the world as a global policy on how we address this is how we generate this data. I, I love the fact that we can pinpoint where somebody is pregnant now in Brazil with uh, the exact address where they are, but is that is that data point, should that data point be made available? What is the, what, the ethical boundaries are something that need to be discussed and the, the structures to really meander that uh, using that information and developing that. I, I think it's something we need to advance for sure. But even that, if we're developing trials to then uh, overlap with what Eric was saying and the, the, most of the area he's working with, the, answer, the data that answers a trial, the, the data that answers uh, a clinical question can be used for other things and should be leveraged for that. And there's an ethical piece uh, uh, of how that data contributes to society beyond the scope of uh, generating evidence for that specific answer. I think that's a very important point that is part of the data science world and we need to advance on these conversations. Thank you, Joao. Um, so you're really starting to speak to kind of the need for good data principles and policies, practices, et cetera. And this would be, um, make, uh, let's come back to this kind of topic more broadly and touch on some of the specific questions on um, data privacy. So I'd, I think I'd like to, let's turn to Eric and come to some of the, the there's two related questions in the Q&A. And from here, what we have here, how do um, we balance the increased precision afforded with the newer technologies we've been talking about with the ethics of maintaining individuals' privacy and data confidentiality. And after we've spoken with Eric, let's move to Andy and perhaps you could give some examples from Flowmind and his work there. So yes, Eric. Yeah, I think this is another huge concern. Um, as as uh, models get more flexible, the idea of using them on aggregated data uh, becomes less uh, privacy protecting. So if I fit a very simple model to a large population and I give you that model, you may not be able to recover much about the individual participants. But if I give you a very flexible model, um, it'd be very easy for you to recover individual information. And as with the more and more models we fit to a data set, you know, even if any one of them is maybe differentially private some by some measure, uh, once you start putting those together, uh, now you have a huge issue. And so I think a major area of research now is how do we build systems where different healthcare uh, organizations can share data to make better decisions, but still respect the privacy of individuals. And I think there's also just a need for better 
consenting about how people's data are used. So certainly there are people who don't mind having their data being used for research. And we are seeing you know, these opt-in type projects where you can donate some of your data, but having that be more the norm and having more health education about uh, how your data might be used and these risks, uh, I think just major overhauls is still needed. Thanks so much, Eric. And maybe moving to Andy, you also see that the, uh, the related question of kind of have standards for data privacy and protecting PHI kept up with the volume and innovation in AI work. Um, perhaps, I don't know, using Flowminder, the work there, could you talk briefly about that? Yeah, I think this is similar to what Eric just mentioned. Um, so I guess with, with Flowminder, I mean, we came, it's really, a, we came together um, as a, a, a group to try and work with mobile phone call detail records. So these are, uh, for those who don't know, it's uh, every time you're uh, making or receiving a call or sending a text that's recorded for billing purposes by the mobile operator. Um, and these have been uh, anonymously, when these data are used, they can be incredibly valuable for population level data on movement patterns. Um, but I think it was back in 2008, we started working with these kinds of data and really came together because, uh, around questions about with working with these kinds of data, but it doesn't feel like there are any kind of um, rules, official guidance put in place. We're really just working one-on-one -on -one with a mobile operator and trying to make sure these data are anonymized, but it still feels a bit uncomfortable that we actually have these data and are working with it. So I think things have moved on quite a lot. Um, there, there are now official guidance from mobile operators associations about working with these data. Um, we don't have any of those data ourselves on our computers anymore. It's, we we um, only work with data that's in within the firewall of the mobile operator. It's, uh, there are anon ways to anonymize those data. But I, I still think there are, there's such a variation, and particularly when, as Eric mentioned, you start integrating those with other forms of data, it becomes a real lot of complexity. And um, so things have kind of kept up and are getting better, um, but there are still gaps and a lot of gray areas. Um, the, the value of these kinds of data have been clearly demonstrated, but there's also potential for, um, for bad use of these data for sure. Thank you so much Andy. Now we could keep talking all afternoon but we do know that we need to wrap up by um, 1 p.m. So I'd like to move to um, a final question um, for each of the panelists and I propose that we go to Joao, Eric and to Andy. So we've ta we're talking about AI, um, data science and global health and so this as we've said is a very kind of broad topic, a broad domain, a broad collection of domains. As you reflect on the future of the field and where we're at, kind of what really do you get most excited about? That's what I'd, we'd love to hear about that as we close out this session. So first to Joao. Yeah, uh, well, thanks for the session. It was really great. Uh, and what really gets me excited about this is the fact that we're starting to bring this kind of training to the core principles of uh, education. So Duke has this, in which I strongly agree that bringing AI training, uh, data science training as part of their uh, standard curriculum for every field. Uh, and I think that on the global health perspective, we should also have this mindset of bringing data science and AI as part of a real practical activity in our courses, in our collaboration with our partners. Because I think that we, we've done a lot of work developing data and projects uh, through the, the Duke Global Health Institute collaborations. And, across other collaborations as well. And we need to advance on how we further explore this data. So what really gets me excited is uh, initiatives, kind of, it's kind of the one that we have on the grid project that tries to put together data gen generated across different countries into the same topic, which is traumatic brain injury. And with that, being able to leverage information from data that is coming from countries that are outside of the scope of the high income countries that have capacity and have uh, uh, the structure. So I think I'm very excited with what the next uh, years are gonna bring in terms of data capacity and how we can leverage data in the low-income world as we bring this as big part and big pieces of our collaborations in the work we do. Thank you, Joao. 
Now let's turn to Eric. Eric, what are you most excited about? I think uh, I get most excited when I think about a, sort of a world with no clinical trials. And that's not just because I hate analyzing clinical trial data. It's uh, uh, because I, I imagine that a world where the data is being integrated and we recognize immediately clinical situations where we don't know what to do and there's an opportunity to generate information that's useful without harming the patient. Uh, and, and so instead of, for those, you know, I don't know the, the backgrounds of, of everyone on, this, on the call, but I mean, this idea that to run a clinical trial, we spend months writing a grant, waiting a year to get a response, then get it launched. And then the clinical translation is five to 10 years later. It's so slow where, you know, if we integrated uh, randomization and experimentation just directly into our healthcare systems, and so the whole thing becomes this kind of massive evolving system where, every, where healthcare is constantly improving. Uh, I feel that that'll lower costs and improve patient outcomes uh, and so on. And then a related piece of that is the idea that clinic, clinicians are, are used, they're able to use their expert judgment when it's needed and all sort of simpler trivial decisions are automated. So that's kind of what I get most excited about. Thank you so much, Eric. And now Andy. To round this out, um, what are you most excited about? Uh, yeah, I guess I'm most excited when I see the, um, the, the capacity and skills in geospatial data collection and analysis um, within um, universities, within ministries of health and within national statistics offices um, across some of the, the most resource poor settings are increasing rapidly. Um, and so from the, from the past when I was, I don't know, a nerdy PhD student, just looking at satellite images and, and thinking this is cool, um, to now a situation where we can work directly with um, highly skilled people at national statistics offices and, and, ha and simply give them uh, code, essentially, in some cases, and, and see that being being used uh, to, to guide uh, census planning or to guide how vaccinations are being implemented. That's, yeah, that's really exciting to see that growth in just 10 or 15 years. Um, and it seems to be pretty much accelerating as there's a real geospatial wave of interest that's been, I guess, partly driven by things like Google Earth, things like Google Maps. But, there's a real wave of skills coming across across the whole world and interest and, and seeing those take off um, so that it's not not just us doing some of that work uh, we can we can hand it on it's great that's a great place to um, end this thank you so much Andy and thank you to to Joao to Eric this has been um, wonderful I would love to spend the afternoon continuing to talk with you all. We see there are some questions we have not been able to get to, and we will see about a way of addressing these questions offline at a later time. Thank you so much to all of our attendees, to Michael Penn, Aaron, and Amy Brophy in the background, Mary Brophy in the background, who've been making all of this um, happen for all of us. There's so much going on there that many we don't know is happening in the background when these events take place. And so I'd like to remind you that the next Think Global will be um, on March 17th. This, this will focus on research on the opioid epidemic that will be moderated by Brandon Nettle. So please watch your email for announcement about that and registration. So thank you one and all. There's a lot more to say, a lot more to discuss, but I think we've delved very deeply into um, a number of topics and I hope everybody else has enjoyed this as much as I have. Thank you and goodbye.